Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Ibology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. If you'd like to support the show, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. For the month of January, you can also support the show by participating in the biannual listener survey. Twice a year, I plan to put out a short, anonymous online survey where you can provide feedback and direction for the podcast. Thank you to those of you who have already provided feedback so far, and if you'd like to join in helping out the show, you can find the link to the survey on the front page of the website at silasivology.org. Today's episode is on the article titled, An Electrographic Study of Silicin and 4-Methyl-Alpha-Methyl-Tryptamine, or MP-809, published in 1963. Before we get into the article itself, I want to say first that if you aren't familiar with an electroencephalograph, also known as an EEG, then I definitely recommend that you check out episode 15 of the podcast, because we discuss it in a decent amount of detail there. As a brief note slash refresher, I do want to mention that in this study, they used an intracranial electroencephalograph, which means that they placed the electrodes for the EEG inside the brain rather than along the scalp as it's done when conducting sleep research. Now, this was quite an odd study to me, especially the way it was written, so it took me a bit longer than usual to decide how best to string together this information. I think, though, that the best way to cover this article is to break it into two separate studies. Across both studies, they implanted electrodes into the forebrain of a total of 59 rabbits, specifically in areas such as the caudate nucleus, amygdala, hippocampus, and thalamus. As a quick review, which will be particularly important later in the episode, the brain can be partitioned into three regions, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain, as it sounds, is the forward-most portion of the brain that includes the lobes of the brain that some of you might be most familiar with, such as the frontal lobe, occipital lobe, etc., as well as structures such as the hypothalamus and thalamus. The midbrain, located just below the forebrain, includes structures such as the tectum and the tegmentum. Finally, the hindbrain includes structures such as the medulla, pons, and cerebellum, and rests just above the spinal cord. Notably, structures in the midbrain and hindbrain are important for controlling arousal, not in the sexual sense, but rather meaning feelings of alertness. The primary outcome, so to speak, for both studies was arousal as detected by the EEG. What I mean is that before injecting any drugs into the rabbits, they recorded a normal resting EEG pattern. Then they used either loud noise produced by clapping or pain stimulation, in order to elicit a change in the EEG patterns recorded. The observed change was called the arousal response. They unfortunately don't elaborate on why this was the outcome of interest. However, they do at least discuss how they picked the drugs that they chose to investigate. Although the article title only mentions psilocin and MP809, the researchers actually investigated five drugs in study number one, and then focused in more specifically on just psilocin and MP809 in study number two. In study number one, the aim was to determine how much of each of the five drugs of interest was needed in order to elicit an arousal response that somewhat matched the arousal response produced from the clapping or pain stimulation. The five drugs of interest were chosen because they were all indolamines that were similar to serotonin, but with one key difference. While serotonin has a chemical group attached to the fifth position along the indole ring, these five drugs all had chemical groups attached to the fourth position along the indole ring. If you'd like to hear more about the structure of indolamines and what specifically we mean when we talk about the fifth and fourth position along the indole ring, definitely check out episode three, where we spend the entire episode discussing that topic in detail. For now, really the main takeaway here is that these drugs had a common feature that distinguished themselves from serotonin, and were thus interesting to the researchers. The five drugs of interest were psilocybin, psilocin, MP809, MP14, and 1-methyl psilocybin, 
which is just Silas Ivan with an extra methyl group off of position 1 on the indole ring. Now MP809 stands for 4-methyl-alpha-methyltryptamine, and MP14 stands for 4-hydroxy-alpha-methyltryptamine. I'll put a diagram of the drug so you can see what their structures look like in the episode transcript, which you can find on the website. The key note about MP809 and MP14 is that they are both related to alpha-methyltryptamine, a psychedelic stimulant that was briefly marketed as the antidepressant called Indipan in Russia. I believe both MP809 and MP14 were also being researched in the 60s as possible antidepressants. So after injecting these five drugs into the rabbits at various doses, they determined that they needed to inject between 0.5 and 2 milligrams of psilocin per kilogram of body weight into the rabbits in order to obtain an arousal pattern on the EEG. Comparatively, much more psilocybin was needed to achieve the same response. The researchers found that between 4 to 8 milligrams per kilogram was needed of psilocybin in order to cause arousal. This is consistent with psilocin being more potent than psilocybin. Interestingly, when they examined 1-methylpsilocybin, they found the additional methyl group further reduced the level of potency. Between 6.8 and 12.6 mg per kilogram of 1-methylpsilocybin was needed in order to elicit arousal. If you happen to have just gone back to listen to episode 3, you might remember that they found a similar result in that study. Namely, that the addition of a chemical group on the first position along the indole ring appeared to reduce the potency of both psilocin and psilocybin. As for the last two drugs, they found that MP14 had a level of potency somewhere between psilocybin and 1-methylpsilocybin. An injection of between 5 to 7 milligrams per kilogram was needed in order to elicit an arousal response. MP809, on the other hand, had a potency that was very close to that of psilocin. The researchers needed only about 1 to 2 milligrams per kilogram of MP809 in order to produce an arousal response. Because MP809 and psilocin were the most potent of the two drugs, and because they more consistently produced a reliable arousal response compared to the other three, the researchers decided to focus in on these two drugs during study number two. To understand study number two, I want to first talk briefly about epilepsy. Patients with epilepsy may suffer from a wide variety of seizures, and sometimes their seizures might be localized or occur in one specific brain region, and in other cases their seizures may appear more generalized and widespread across many brain regions. In addition to being localized or generalized, seizures can also propagate to other areas of the brain starting from wherever they originated. This propagation of activity is in essence what the researchers are studying in study number two. It's also important to know that in some cases of severe epilepsy, doctors may transect or cut around the brain tissue where a seizure is originating so that it does not spread to other areas of the brain. One example is when seizures might be originating from one hemisphere of the brain, but then propagate to the other. Doctors can transect the tissue that connects the two hemispheres. This is of course not common and a very last resort measure for severe epilepsy, but it has been shown to reduce the severity and violence of epileptic seizures. While the primary outcome was still the presence of an arousal response, as indicated by the electrodes that were placed in the forebrain, the aim of study number two was to determine whether the arousal response originated from the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, or spinal cord. To do this, they took three groups of rabbits and in each group performed a transection or cut at varying locations to try and identify the origin of the response. In the first group, they performed a transection that separated their forebrain from the midbrain. In the second group, they performed a transection that separated their midbrain from their hindbrain. And in the third group, they performed a transection that separated their hindbrain from their spinal cord. Half of each group were given psilocin, and half were given MP809. Keeping in mind that the electrodes picking up the EEG response were kept in the forebrain, if the researchers then still observed an arousal response in group 1, theoretically the origin of that electrical activity would be coming from the forebrain. If the researchers did not observe an arousal response in group 1, then that would indicate the electrical activity responsible for the arousal pattern 
would be originating from either the midbrain, hindbrain, or spinal cord. As you start to move the transection further back, you start to localize the origin of the arousal pattern. So what did they find? They found that in group one, where the transection was between the forebrain and the midbrain, no arousal pattern was found after administration of either MP809 or Silicin. In group two, with the transection between the midbrain and the hindbrain, they similarly found no arousal pattern after administering Silicin, but did see an arousal pattern after MP809. In group three, with the transection between the hindbrain and the spinal cord, they found an arousal pattern after administration of both Silicin and MP809. From this pattern of results, the authors concluded that while MP809 acts at the midbrain and possibly the hindbrain as well, Silicin does not have midbrain activity and instead activates regions of the hindbrain. Interestingly, they note in the conclusion that this matches similar observations found when studying LSD. Now, although interesting, we definitely know that psychedelics, including psilocin, exert their effects in a far greater number of brain regions than just the hindbrain. I think one of the issues with this paper is that the authors overgeneralized their outcome. It sounded as though they erroneously believed this arousal pattern is the primary cause for the effects of these drugs, rather than one of the symptoms of sympathomimetics, or drugs that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. It's not at all surprising they found that the arousal pattern emanated from either the midbrain or hindbrain structures, because as we noted, these regions we know today are key at controlling states of arousal. It is incredibly likely that what they were really locating wasn't the site of action for these drugs, but rather the site of action for autonomic arousal. Although the researchers used loud noise and pain to identify a baseline arousal pattern, they never used a loud noise or pain to try and elicit arousal patterns in any of the transected rabbits. I bet if they did, which would constitute a proper control group, they'd find results that were similar to either what they found for Silicin or MP809. Of course, there's still a possibility that there is something uniquely interesting going on in that arousal activity was found coming from the midbrain after MP809 administration, but not Silicin administration. However, I'd want to see that finding replicated before reading too much into it. Either way, it doesn't actually get at what the authors were really trying to find out, which is where these drugs exerted their effects in the nervous system. As we'll see in this podcast, we do know much more about this today than we ever have, but there are still a ton of unknown questions, even with our significant advances in technology. And with that, that's it for today's episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the podcast, please let me know. You can find out all the ways to reach me on the website, silasibology.org, where you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. If you have a moment, please also fill out the biannual listener survey. The feedback will really help support the show. Plus, at the end of the survey, you'll get to vote on the recipient of a $100 donation. There are five pro-psilocybin organizations that you have the option to vote for, if that's something you support. You can find the survey on the front page of the website. Thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you next time.